It can be. What we're talking about is the Lord having His way in every believer. Amen? So that He can begin to function and have what He wants. Amen? It's an amazing thing to see. As we said yesterday, you know, we had that little wedding and the people were in here and there was some of that going on. Did you notice that? Everybody was just kind of not just doing their part, but following the Lord and had His way. So that's kind of what I'm hoping to get to maybe sometime this morning. I don't know. To the part of the Holy Spirit and the church. Let me see if I can find my place. Lord Jesus, we do ask you to take these simple words, speak to us from your word and by your spirit. That when two or more are gathered in your name, you're in the midst. I know the Holy Ghost dwells in the believers here, he dwells in me. And we just want the meeting of your spirit to minister these things to your people. Amen? So we've been talking about that when Jesus, the Holy Spirit couldn't come until Jesus was glorified. Amen? When He's glorified, His work is finished as far as the work of salvation. He said it's finished. He goes and He sits at the right hand of the Father, the place of all power. The Father's given everything to Him. Everything is under Jesus' feet until the day Jesus gives it back to His Father, right? And everything is complete. So He is Lord of Lords and now King of Kings. And we saw how that he, he told the believers to wait and to tarry until they've been empowered from on high. This is important. We need to wait till we're empowered on a high. We have to wait till we know the Lord is the one doing the work. Amen? And they waited. They waited in that upper room and we know the Holy Spirit came. Not just a feeling, not an emotion. He is called the Holy Spirit because God is a spirit. He's not like us. But He is the third person of the Trinity. This is important. He's a person. Right? The third person of the Trinity. Yep. He's completely other than us. As you've heard me quote many times as A.W. Tozer has said, you can have feelings and not have faith. But if you have faith, you're going to have feelings. Amen? So you have to start with faith. So it's not just emotion. It's also not our conscience. A while back I heard some advertising for a church on the radio or something and the preacher was doing a little thing and he was saying, the Holy Ghost, is, it, it, it's, that's what our conscience is and this and this. And it was, it, it was okay, but it was incorrect. The Holy Spirit is not our conscience. We're given a conscience from the Lord. Lost people have a conscience, right? We have a conscience. The Holy Spirit is completely other than we are. Amen? And He speaks to us. Now, you may come in a meeting, you may feel a little downtrodden, it might have been a rough week, a rough week, and you come in and we begin to sing and worship the Lord. And the Holy Spirit stirs in your heart because it says in our hearts, the Spirit of Jesus is crying, Abba, Father, all the time. Yeah? That's why we don't have to work anything up. And you begin to come in and all of a sudden you feel like, man, I'm feeling joyful. I'm feeling excited about the Lord. I'm feeling, I'm feeling, I'm feeling full of the Holy Spirit. Those are feelings, and that's a good thing, and it originates from what? From the Lord. Amen? And as I said, that's why when we come in here, and whether I've had a rough week or not, or what's going on, I never get up here and try to work people into worship. I've led worship my whole life. I, I just don't have to do it. I get up, and I don't even try to get spiritual. I just start playing my guitar, start singing what, what the Lord or whatever land in them has picked out for this morning, and, and I start singing. And before you know it, it's like, wow, this get pretty exciting. Yeah, that's why towards the end of the worship, it just got more and more intense, right? We're supposed to be wrapping it up or something. And so you can have, have feelings and no faith, but you have faith, you're going to have the real feelings of the Lord. It's something other than that. Amen. He comes and he dwells inside of us for his purposes. So we've, been, we've talked about that, that we can't really go forward without the Holy Spirit. I just want to take a moment before we step into some of the things of the Holy Spirit in the church, because I did mention that we were going to talk about sanctification, and uh, that you can't have real holiness without the Holy Spirit. Amen? You can't. If you, if you try to have sanctification or holiness without the working of the Holy Spirit, at the very least you wound up uh, being dry and dead, and at the most you wound up, you wind up in legalism. Amen. 
But that's not what the Lord wants. It says in 2 Timothy 2, 3, But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. Peter goes on in 1 Peter 1, 2, he says, Even elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit, unto obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. So again, he says, through the sanctification of the Spirit. And then, Paul, we know in the book of Galatians, Paul's whole dilemma with that whole church and that whole book was trying to get them not to yield to the Judaizers and try to get back under the law, but be a people who walked by the Spirit. Yeah? Now, this is, this is so important. Right now where we are in this time, because things are getting more evil every day, right? So spiritually, we're just not, you know, things can start off bad and things can start off evil or, 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 or crooked and twisted or whatever. And they're just bad and they're harmful. But Satan keeps on that same road and people keep on that road and all of a sudden evil just begins to break out. And there's things that are happening now that are just evil. Who ever thought at a time where where you can't even talk politics because it's come down to our government is doing evil, evil things. The things that are being done to, to children and all that are just evil. They're not, I disagree with them, they're just evil. And it doesn't mean one side's gonna, gonna correct all that. It may stay it for a while, but there's such evil in power. And that's all around us. So spiritually, things are going on. That spiritual realm is becoming more real and pressing in. And there's never been such a time where this generation is marked. What is this? Is this Z or X or whatever? Yeah? Rachel's like, don't ask me. We're not millenniums anymore. This is the next one, right? It's Z, X? Thank you, CJ. Never been a time where people haven't been so anxious. Because we're heading towards men's heart failing with the fear. So the anxiety out there is incredible. Everybody's struggling with anxiety. Yeah. And so uh, all these things are going on and they're all pressing in and pressing in. And so it's important that the church truly, truly, truly be a spiritual people. But separated in the sanctification in the right way from all that junk. Right? From all the, all the spiritualism that's going on. All the emotionalism. All the, all the things that are going on in the wrong way. This is why we talk about the paraclete, and his name is, it means comforter. It means the one that shores you up. It means the ones that helps you. In fact, it's hard to define, really translate that, that term in the fullness of the way it's supposed to be, because what we need to do is experience it. If you've experienced the Holy Ghost, and you know, he's, he's held me up at times when I couldn't be held up. He's come and comforted me. He's come and shored me up. He's come and given me strength. He's come and given me power to witness. He's come and given me the words I need. So instead of always just trying to define it, we need to experience it. And so this is why it's important that the Holy Spirit comes and He sanctifies it. What does that mean? It means He separates us out. He comes and says, this one is mine. That one is mine. Yeah. And He begins to speak to us about how we're to live. Amen? There's certain things we don't need to argue about. Yeah? It's like the Bible says, don't be drunk with wine, be ye filled with the Spirit. So it's like, we don't need to, you don't need to hear the Holy Ghost of, oh, I think I'll go and get by me a six-pack and drink six beers. It's like, well, you don't need to hear that. Right? To watch something that's going to soil you in, in, in some R-rated movie or something, you don't need to hear the Lord on that. It's quite, it's quite clear that it's the, of what the Bible says about those kind of things. But this is not what God's after. It's not, God doesn't need us just to have the rules and regulations. What He wants to know, wants us to know is how to walk with Him and to really hear Him. Amen? So when He says we were sanctified by the Holy Spirit, there's a holiness that has to do with the Holy Spirit. Amen? It says in Romans that Jesus walked by the Spirit of holiness. Amen? You know, when we were very young in the Lord, we were excited to be saved, excited to be filled. We were witnessing, we were on the streets, and then, then we began to see God's holiness. You know, God will bring you into periods of, of refreshing, or periods of, of, 
of freedom or periods of this where there's a period, and this is a good period for young men especially, to go through that period of holiness. Man, we got to get a hold of God. Amen? Yeah. Too many young believers today want to argue with you about what kind of liberty they have and can they do this and can they do that. We were the opposite. We had to be careful. I think we were even drifting a little bit into a little bit of legalism because we were just so on fire. Right? But then God began to show me, look, this is fine the way you're walking. But you got to learn to hear from me, amen. You got to learn to hear from me. That's why what God allows one person to do, He might not allow another to do. Because He's speaking to you, amen. And He wants you to walk by the Spirit. Sanctification. He's in charge, amen. Like when it says in the the the, the uh, church at Antioch that they were had a time of fasting and praying, so they're seeking God, and it says the Holy Spirit said. The Holy Spirit said, sanctify. In other words, separate out Paul and Barnabas for the work of God. Now, before we engage in any kind of missionary work, and I've been a missionary, and all these organizations I see, and maybe some of them are the Lord or not, I don't know. But before anybody engages in all that, they need to know this. Has the Holy Spirit spoken? I've been, I was on mission field for many, many years. And I tell you, I ran into a lot of people and sometimes I would think, what are you doing out here? Somebody told them that's what they should do. Some young man was zealous for the Lord. I, I see this again and again with young men. I meet young men, they're like, they're on fire for God. And somebody says, after they're saved a year or two, oh, they, they say, man, they're on fire. They don't know what to do with them. I know what to do with them. Turn them loose and, and give them some instruction, right? And love them. But somebody will say, you ought to be in Bible school. So he goes to Bible school. And then say somebody told her that. Then they meet in Bible school. And then they get married or whatever. Then they said, now what are we going to do? we got to find a place to work. The whole thing's on the wrong ground. I know it's difficult to say that. I'm not picking on everything. But if I can read, like I tell people, Mama taught me to read. Actually, Mama didn't teach me to read. Sister Mary Hatchett taught me to read. But anyway, I learned to read. And it says right there, the Holy Spirit spoke and said, separate out these two for me. Paul and Barnabas, for the work that I have for them. Same thing with the, with the evangelist Philip, where the Holy Spirit took him here and took him there. That doesn't mean we don't organize things once they're there. Once Paul and them were separated out, then the Spirit started telling them where to go. I'm sure they had to pack their bags. I'm sure they had to, to, to begin to do the things He wanted them to do. But we've got to hear the Lord first. He sets us separate for work that He has for us. Amen? He's the one that's in charge. This is where we're heading now. Is the, the, the he, he, He's going to bring the church into what, where she needs to be and what she needs to be doing. But we've got to be willing to hear Him. We've got to hear Him. So it's not wrong to, to have a building. It's not wrong to have a meeting time. It's not wrong to organize some things as long as you're yielding to the Holy Spirit. But as we said, we don't grieve the Spirit, and we grieve Him when we're like, this is what we're going to do. But what if He wants to do this? Yeah. This is why it's so important when we begin to talk about the church functioning. Because, you know, I've been around, and, and, and I love, I, you hear me say it all the time, the organic church. And we have to have life before we have farm. And I've experienced some really organic church. I think there's some organic things going on right now right here in our midst. But when people, and it's going to happen even more as people are going to get burnt in a lot of what's going on, then they begin to say, well, well, then there are no leaders. There are, are no this. And, and, and they say, we just want to meet simply and organically, and that's beautiful. And then it begins to say, well, no one's in charge. Well, that's not right. It's the Lord's in charge. When you want to have a meeting where the Lord's really moving and everybody has a part to play, right? That doesn't mean we have an uh, he's the author of confusion. It means he's Lord of everybody's heart. Amen. That he's got to be. He's got to be in charge. He's got to be able to speak to those individuals. Does that make sense? In other words, I've had people tell me, "Well, I, I'd like to have a meeting, you know, where no one's in charge." Well, you can't have that because the Holy Spirit's in charge. And that means, in most of those people that talk like that, said, "I want to go somewhere where no one's in charge." It's like, well, what you're saying is you don't want the Lord to be in charge of your life. Amen. You want Him to be in charge of your life. 
But when people start coming in and they're like, I'm submitted to the Holy Spirit, then all of a sudden you're going to start having meetings like that. Now, everybody won't be there because you'll have visitors. You have people that are just getting saved or people who aren't saved. But you, God begins to have a core group of people that are saying, I go into those meetings saying, Lord, what do you want? Amen? What do you want? How do you want this to go? And that's where that sanctification comes with the Holy Spirit. You know, that's what sanctifying means. It means just set apart. Set apart. There's certain things the Lord allows in my life and certain things He does, doesn't allow. Because to stand up here and do what I what He's calling me to do, right? I have to I have to watch my mind and watch my soul and watch what goes on in my heart leading up all, to all this. Yeah? So that there can be that purity that he wants. Not a purity that, that emanates from me, or not a holier than thou, but just simply being set apart for him. Amen? So that we know his anointing, and we know what he wants. Give me half a second to, to bring something up here, if you, if you will. You'd think I would get all this stuff right to begin with, but... Well, maybe that's not going to work for me. Oh, I need melody sometimes. So that sanctification is important to move forward in what we want to move forward. Amen. And what we want to move forward in is the Holy Ghost's place in the church. And when we bring that up, many people, if they don't understand or they think, oh, it's ho the holy places. You want to have a Pentecostal meeting. You want to have this kind of meeting. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is let's go back to here again. Jesus is glorified. He's at the right hand of the Father. Amen. His work is complete. Salvation is complete. Sins of, sins of the world have been paid for. Yeah. He's now in a place of authority. He's now at the right hand of the Father. He's now in a place where all the inheritance that He has won can now be distributed and partaken of by His church. And how's that going to happen? It's going to happen by the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, I have many things to say to you, and you cannot hear them now. But when He comes, He will lead you into all truth. Yeah. You see, this is this is so important. When Paul uses terms like, like when Paul says, uh, uh, the unsearchable riches of Christ. When again and again he speaks of, of uh, the riches of his grace, like in Ephesians 1 7, whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. In Ephesians 2 7, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and the kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. And then in Ephesians again, what, this is all Ephesians, the heavenly church. Unto whom I am less than the least of all the saints. This is Paul talking. In this grace is given that I, given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. And we'll take a minute. Can we slow down and listen to these words? Ephesians. According to the riches of His grace. Ephesians 2.7. The exceeding riches of His grace and His kindness towards us through Jesus Christ. And again, that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. Listen to these words. The riches of His grace, the unsearchable. This is what the Holy Ghost is about. This is a work. Are we tasting these riches? Are we walking in these riches? The Holy Ghost wants to bring down these riches in heaven. When you think about these things, when Paul speaks of unsearchable riches, think about, think about how much of our preaching. It's been said before. Gene Edwards said it, but I'll quote it again. He said, there's never been more Christianity in America than there is today in many ways. But it's going to go down as the shallowest Christian generation there ever was in America. You think about these. These are the riches of the kingdom. When we, we read these words and we go, yes, I'm blessed. But we don't stop and say the unsearchable riches. What are these riches? The riches of His grace. What are these riches? 
What are these depths he's talking about? That you'd know the heights and the length, length and the depth of his love. There's so much he has for us. And I believe in a practical Christianity. I'm blessed for that. And there's a time for that. We're not doing it right now, this morning. This is why I spend so much time, and, and I need the, the other elders here to help me in that, with making myself available, because there has to be time of personal discipleship. That's when discipleship happens. Let me spend some time with you. Let me sit with you. Let me get with you. But that's not what we're doing this morning. What we're doing this morning is trying to alert the church to what the Holy Spirit is trying to do. We spend so much time practically telling people how to keep your marriage together, how to just keep yourself going forward. And many times we need that. But we have so much of talking about how to be a good neighbor, how to learn your Bible, how to do this, how to do that. And we never even get to the point of what are these riches? How many times do you meet Christians who are like, man, I just want to hear about the riches of the kingdom? You know, when I was a young man, and, and people would come and they would say, where can I go to hear convicting preaching? Where can I go to hear somebody just talk about Jesus? Where can I go to hear more about Jesus and the depths of Jesus? I don't hear that right now. I hear, where can I go where they'll take care of my kids? Where can I go where the preacher preaches a nice, a nice sermon? Where can I go where the music makes me feel good? I'm glad the music can make you feel excited for the Lord, but I'm also hoping and praying that the music is convicting. Amen? If we're singing, you should be in the presence of the Lord. So Jesus is at the right hand of the Father. So we're, we're going back over some ground we've been on. And He's gone to heaven. And He's at the right hand of the Father. The Father is satisfied. He's completely satisfied. Yeah. Jesus has paid the price. He's satisfied. He's accepted us into His kingdom. Amen? Jesus has done it. He's at the right hand of the Father. But now, he wants his church, who's been left here, to partake and be connected with the riches that he has. Amen? Let's be clear. Have you heard these terms? That Paul said, I'm, we're, 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 we're uh, adding up, or we're fulfilling up the sufferings of Christ till he comes. You ever thought about that? And, I'm, and, and when Paul talks about the sufferings of the Lord and stuff, because Jesus is done. He's at the right hand of the Father. He's a heavenly man. But His church is here as a witness. Is she not? The church is here. The church is His body. The church, the church is His presence here in this earth. But He doesn't want to leave us comfortless. He, he wants to send His Holy Spirit to what? To the individuals? Amen. But to His church. So He can lead His church into where she needs to go. And this is why his church suffers. This is why sometimes you suffer in things. Because we're filling up that suffering of the Lord. We're walking out. We're walking out the life of the Lord in this life, in this world, in time and space. But he doesn't lead us comfortless. Does, does this help you see more what the Holy Spirit wants to do? In the last move of God, God just poured his gifts on his church. And it was beautiful. And the church just played with them for a lot of it. Because that's just human nature. We were, people were like kids. We have to grow up. Yeah. God's not sorry he did that. And the gifts are important. But it's time the church began to grow up more and more. Amen. And to know, this is what these gifts are for. Amen. This is what this is about. This is what's supposed to go on. So he sends his spirit to guide us into what? All truth to teach us and to guide us. Amen. To be the engine in the church of everything that's going to go forward. See, if you describe the church as a group of voluntary people who come together for worship and for edification and to learn about God and do the work of God, that's incorrect. I know that sounds strange, but that's incorrect. Because then all of a sudden, you just simply have a bunch of hands and feet and ears that get together. You have a body there. You have, you, it, has a, it has a soul. It has a body. It has a function. It, but it's missing something. People in the world do that. That's not the church. It is the church. It is His body. And it's got to be connected to the head. That's Jesus. 
And then the Holy Spirit, he sent his spirit to be the very engine of the whole thing, to guide us into, the, into all truths, to glorify Jesus, to lead the church on. Do you understand that? Do you see that? We have to have the yielding of the Spirit in the church to take us on, to guide us, and to lead us. Yes? If not, then we are a body. And maybe you're, you're acknowledging a head even though we're maybe not connected to it. And you have hands and feet and you're doing all kind of work. But it's got to be the work of the Holy Spirit in you. It's got to be His way. So, so the Father sends us, sends us, the Holy Ghost. This is why you understand why he says, I'll only glorify Jesus. Why? Because it's Jesus in the earth. Amen. It's Jesus that's his testimony of what his salvation has done. Jesus is the one that the Father's given everything into. Yeah. That's why you don't worship the Holy Spirit. That's why we don't we don't focus on him. We focus on Jesus. But we submit to the Holy Spirit. We acknowledge his work. We see his work. And we let His work be fulfilled. Do you see that? Without, the, without the, the work of the Holy Spirit, then the church, there is no real church going forward. So we have to be careful about that, how we describe that. Yeah? Because if not, that's that humanism we talk about. Because men out there today, they can have a conscience. They can have an intellect. They can, they can have a heart that wants to do good and accomplish good things. But we've got to know, what is the life of the Holy Spirit saying? Amen? It's got to be that. That's where true edification comes from. And true life comes from. That's why we say, when, when, when on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, He filled those believers. But it was the day the church was started, because now God had come down and tabernacled among men. Amen? When Jesus walked this earth, He was God incarnate. He was here. He was healing people. He was teaching. He was touching people. He was fulfilling the Lord's work. And then he told his disciples that he had to go away. He said, I'm going away. So after he dies, he's resurrected. He's at the right hand of the Father. Jesus is no longer in the earth. His teachings are in the earth. He can come and interact anytime he wants. He's God. His people are in the earth. But Jesus at the right hand of the Father until the day of Pentecost when He sends the Holy Ghost. And the life of Jesus is alive in His church again. Amen? It's so important that we see these things. So important that we... that we. This is why the yielding is so important to the Lord. Say, Lord, I want You to have Your way in my life. Yeah? Completely have Your way in my life. We yield to Him. I'm telling you, I'm telling you this morning, God's going to have a people they are going to be filled the problem is, it's not going to look like what people think it is. What will it look like, Brother Frank? I'm not sure. I'm not sure, but I know God is taking great pains to, to bring some of us through the wilderness for not just a few years. We're talking decades. Being hidden away for decades so that he could, there could be no preconceived notions at all. To say, God, do whatever you want. However you want. But we know he'll have a people that will be filled. We'll know have a people they'll 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 be baptized in the spirit. We know have a people will be moving in it. But it may, may not be like we think. But it'll be a people that are gonna go forward in what God wants, hearing what God wants. Amen. And I'm telling you, we're in a time where there's so much pressing in from the world. And even in the, in the kingdom, there's been so much, this sounds funny to say, but so much education at times in the wrong way, where people have been so educated to a point where it's like, what does God want? To really hear from Him. This is why that surrender is so important. This is if you see the, 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 the uh, laying out of events that happen even for those apostles. They walk with God. They had the teachings. They saw His wonders. They historically got to know Him. They were close to Him. And then they had to come to the point of the cross where they realized what they could not do. That Peter could not stand for Him. That all of them would desert Him. They had to see 
the otherness of who Jesus was. And then the cross comes. There's the cross first. Just like in the Old Testament, there's always the shedding of blood. There's always the sacrifice before, before you get to the oil. And there's the brokenness and there's the cross. And they come to a place of, we cannot. We can't go forward. We have to wait in Jerusalem. He's not here. And at that point, then the Holy Spirit comes. And it's the Holy Spirit that's going to do the work. Amen? And when the Holy Spirit does the work, we're carried forward in a different way. Amen? This is why so many people are burnt out. So many people are stressed out. So many even preachers sometimes are the worst. They're the worst to try to fellowship with because they're just so busy. Well, I, I get kind of busy and I get kind of tired. But I'm always wanting to, to gauge it by, man, if I start getting burnt out and start getting empty, something's wrong. Then it's me doing the work and not him. There's a difference between just being physically tired. But there's a freshness in the Lord when we're constantly yielded to Him. Amen. The Holy Spirit's work is to come. And He comes to take us forward, the church to show us, listen, Jesus is in heaven. Right hand of the Father. You're saved. You're saved. The blood of Jesus has saved you. You're going to heaven. Amen. But He's left you here for a reason. Like Paul said, I'm, I'm torn between two things. Should I go ahead and... and and, and be sacrificed for the Lord, so to speak, and go ahead and be with Him, or should I stay with you? It's more expedient to stay with you. We're saved. We're secure. Yeah? We're, we're, we're here in Houston. We're in the Bible Belt, right? We're, we're, most of Christianity settles down. You're saved. You're baptized. Just hang on. Live a good life and go to heaven. But the Holy Spirit came to say, now I'm going to allow you to see your inheritance. While you're on the earth, you're going to be a witness to what Jesus has done. These riches are yours. These riches are yours. I'm going, to, I'm going to show you about these riches. I'm going to lead you in to these things. I'm going to let you begin to partake of these things. How many of you have had, maybe you had a bad week, maybe you had a bad day, maybe you even failed some, and yet you get in the presence of the Lord, and if your heart is open, the Holy Spirit begins to minister to you. And sometimes you've had some of your best moments and some of those most broken moments. Is that not true? Why is that? It's because you're coming to the end of yourself. Instead of there being an emptiness, there's an openness that says, listen, I'm pouring these on you. That's why sometimes we don't, we don't understand the Lord's ways in those ways. Sometimes you have to learn that there's a door in front of you. There's a cross in front of you. There's a, a road in front of you. And this is, this is the fear of God. You know, I don't want to go down this road. But I know going down this road will be riches. I know He'll take me on a deeper walk. If you look at Paul, where does Paul's ministry come from? It doesn't come from Paul as this fantastic preacher. And Paul has this huge ministry. And Paul, Paul's got all these books he's written and Paul's do Paul's comes from this brokenness. You read about this this man and he goes he goes, you, you had pity upon me in my affliction. I came to you in weakness. But what pours forth from you? Richness. Richness. God the Holy Spirit is brought to say, I want to bring you into all truths. I want to show you your inheritance. What was that song by Russ Traff years ago when it says when uh, uh, Satan is a liar and he comes to make you think that you're paupers and really children of the king? This is what happens to us, amen? This is why I'm saying some of you think, Brother Frank's just trying to encourage me. And it's like, no, I, I, I know you can be a bonehead. So can I. I know your struggles. I know that but when I'm talking to you, I'm coming from the ground of you're a, you're a prince, you're a princess. You're, you're of tremendous value to God because of the tie that you have with God. This is beyond self-esteem, amen? This is beyond. Can you understand me now a little bit where it's like, look, I'm not against just marriage counseling or counseling all this, but, but we're missing the boat. I was on a Bible app the other day and they, they had one of those scrolling adver advertisements and this, this site doesn't really advertise 
uh, things except, you know, Christian things. But it was like, listen, we'll f you can fast track a year of counseling. In one year, we'll give you a counseling degree. And I'm thinking, man, what are you guys doing? You're unleashing an army of counselors who are just going to do some online thing. This is not the riches of Christ. This is what we do. This is what we do. And what we have to do is get a hold of the riches of Jesus. And this is what the Holy Spirit's trying to lead us into. Now do you understand where I threw some of you when I talked about the church a few minutes ago where it's like we can have the hands and the feet and we can have people voluntarily get together and say we want just edification, we want to worship. But that doesn't make a church, it doesn't make it functioning. The functioning comes when the Holy Spirit fills that church, when it's connected with the head. And the good works are the works that Larry's been quoting to us that you're predestined for. Amen? I'm telling you this morning, telling you the Holy Spirit's at work. And I'm going to tell you, some, some of you need to know even right here, the Holy Spirit's at work in our midst. People can't see it because it's like, well, I didn't come in and Sister Lulu didn't do a spin and start, start, start uh, ministering some gift or, or they just didn't go crazy when they were worshiping or whatever. But the Holy Spirit is at work. But you, because God is trying to wean His church off off the senses, what you see, what you feel, what you touch, all that he's trying to wean it off because there's a work going on beneath the surface. And people can't see it. And it's beginning to bud a little bit. There's a little bitty bud breaking through the dirt here and a little bud breaking through the dirt there. And it's ignored. And people say, well, that's nothing. Look at this great big tree here. That tree's going to fall over in the wind like that because there's no roots. God's been doing a deep work. And it's hard to do this, is it not? It's hard to do this. Because people want results, and we want results. But you've got to say you've got to pay the price. It, it, it puts the fear of God on me because we're going toward the end time and people are talking about it. And even much of Christianity is talking about it like, we've got to teach people, we've got to do this. We've got to be ready. It's like, no, you don't understand. To get ready, you've got to stop. You've got to repent. All of us do. And you've got to let the roots go down deep. Well, how do we do that? How do we do that overnight? What book do we buy? What program do we do? Your roots, it's organic. You've got to stop. And you've got to let the, the rain pound on you and the wind blow on you. And you've got to suffer through it. And you've got to be blinded by the dust that comes. And you've got to let your roots go down deep. And it takes time. How many I've talked to, we talk about counseling, people I'll sit with and say, okay, this is what God wants. Put some roots down. This is what God wants. Settle down and start getting a hold of it. This is what God wants. Like, No, no, I need something now. You can go find that on lots of corners here in this city. This is what God's doing. Because, not because He's harsh. Not because He wants us to suffer. Not because He's, a, he's an exacting God. Like the man said that buried his talent. But because He wants you to taste of His riches. This is what He wants. He wants you to taste of His riches. The riches of His grace. He wants you to taste of Him. To know that. That's what I'm saying. In the last move of God, God poured His gifts out. It's not, not that it wasn't God. I was around then. It was the Lord. And like children, people take those things, we take those things, and we play with them. It doesn't mean they're wrong. It means we have to grow up and say, I see. Amen? But we're missing that today. We're missing it. It's so like I said at, at my mother's funeral, we stood there and, and my grandparents came as, as immigrants and my mom and dad had nothing when they started. And yet I stood in front of this room filled with people, filled with children. And most of them were prosperous people. It was huge. And I said, you know, when I grew up, I'd go to a friend's house and I'd say, where are your parents? They, oh, they're... They're out so we can have a party or whatever. So where did they go? They said, they're dancing. And I, I would be shocked. I'd like, dancing? My parents never. They never went dancing. My parents never went anywhere. My dad worked six days a week. My mother raised seven boys. But I told those people in that funeral, I said, they were living. They weren't living for themselves. They were living for you. They were living for you. 
But you see that we've adopted the psychology of the world. The psychology of the world is, is look, we have 2.5 children. We give them everything they want. We do all that. We're, and people will tell me, I'm living for my kids. I can't do this for God. I'm living for my kids. And then tell me, I can't do that. God, God wants me to make my wife happy. I have to do this. I have to just like, no, no, pay the price. Pay the price for what God wants down the line. And see, that's what God's doing with us. He's knowing your roots got to be deep. He loves us. We don't see it to begin with. Amen? We didn't see that when I grew up. I didn't think, I thought, man, what is my dad doing? All my brothers, we, we all left, became businessmen and all that. We always thought, why was he just this little grocer? Why couldn't he go do something else? Because he was, he was working 12 hours a day, six days a week to put food on the table. He wasn't concerned about what he was doing. He was trying to live for the next generation. And we don't do that. And I'm telling you, and I hate to say these things, but it's true. We have a problem in Christianity because we have had a whole generation that has lived for themselves and hasn't been putting a foundation for the next generation. And we're in trouble. We've got to have preachers and ministers and elders and some of you that are willing to pay the price. Some of you, and I won't use that term, CJ, because you're right, young men, but men that are younger than me. That's why, why, why God is requiring so much of y'all for what's coming for the next generation. Somebody has to pay that price. We have a whole young men out there, they don't know what the church is trying to correct it by having men's, men's meetings and, 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 and clubs and all that. But the problem is, is we missed a generation and they don't see that. You've got to stop and say, you've got to start with you. Start with you. You be that man. You've got a whole generation of, 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 of women and sisters who were never raised how to be wives and mothers. Ever. In fact, it, it, it's people even in church get angry when you say that. I looked at my mother-in-law once. I said, I want to thank you for my wife. What are you talking about, Frank? I said, I want to thank you. I have the wife I have today because you, you were the kind of wife and mother that she needed. She watched you. She learned how to be a wife and mother for you, from you. Do you think there's a lot of sisters out there that are telling their daughters? You're going to be a wife and mother one day. You need to learn, learn some few things. No, they teach your daughters... You don't need a man. You don't need all that. We have a whole generation that's awash. We have kids, people in the church that were never corrected. It made sense to me when I got saved and God started correcting me. It wasn't nice, but I knew, okay, God, I did it. You're correcting me. You're getting a rod on me. You're correcting me just like my mom and dad did. People don't even know what that means. The Holy Ghost is at work, people. He's at work right now. He's at work in your heart. He's at work in this place. He's at work in many other places too. Amen? There's 7,000. God's got His people everywhere. He's at work to show us the riches. Can you see that now? You see, it's not wrong to have a building. It's not wrong for God to take care of you. But the church is it's not supposed to look like it does today. It's supposed to be alive. They're not supposed to look at you and say, you're prosperous, you're doing good. I like the way you talk. They're supposed to look at you and say, what is it about you? There's a depth in your life. In the last move of God, they'd say, what is it about you? You're happy. You have a smile. And that was okay. But they're going to say in this, in this move, there's a depth about you. There's an unshakableness. What is going on there? Amen. The Holy Spirit is leading the church into all truth, guiding the church, trying to distribute the riches. I have many things to say to you, Jesus said, but you cannot receive them now. But you will be able to receive them. Amen. Once again, I didn't really get where I wanted to go. It's okay. I have to just follow the Lord. Amen. Do you see that? Let the Holy Spirit do His work. Amen? Let Him shore you up. Yeah? If you, if, you, if, 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 you're, if you fail or you're wrong, then let Him convict you and repent. And then let Him shore you up. Amen? We don't have to live in anxiety. We don't have to live in the discouragement. We don't have to live in the depression. Will those things come against us? Yes. But we've got something.
besides that. Something other than us. The Holy Spirit if we yield to Him. It's a real clarion call. Even as a church, God is asking things of us. There's roads we can go to try to turn a corner, get more people in, make things easier, whatever. But we can't do that. We have. We have to do what God wants. Amen? So that He can have His way. Amen? So that there's a house there for people to find. When everything comes down, People need to be able to locate the church. Maybe not the building or the sign, but the church. Amen? Lord Jesus, we come to you this morning. I ask you to take these simple words, God. I'm glad we don't go by feelings or I would feel that, Lord, I, I feel woefully inadequate. But I do sense something of the Spirit here that's touching hearts, God. Because it's you. It's you that will distribute your riches of your graces, your unsearchableness. It's you that can touch hearts, God, not, not, not dedicated to how smart we are, or how quick we are, how disciplined we are, but simply this, how open our hearts is. A simple decision of, yes, Jesus, yes, Jesus, yes, Jesus. God, every way, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. If you'd like somebody to agree with you before you go, Larry and Mark, we'll probably need to pray for Mark this morning.